Jim Scout. Uh, I've been a World War II reenactor for, I don't know, five years. I've been collecting military weapons a lot longer than that. And I'm currently the unit commander of the uh, 90th Infantry uh, U.S. Army. And I'm also the, I'm on the HRS vehicle uh, board, I guess. This is the M1 Durand self-loading rifle, the greatest implement ever devised. Because I think it was General Patton who said that. Uh, John Cantius Grant was the inventor of this rifle. However, it did not happen overnight. Uh, his first, after World War I, in 1921, the U.S. Army look to rifle manufacturers for a self-loading rifle because there were very few used in World War I. The French had one and then you had the Browning Automatic Rifle which made its debut at the very tail end of World War I. Uh, it was felt that troops would be a lot more productive at what they did if they didn't have to cycle bolts and they had a few more rounds in the gun to get the job done. So, in ninth, way back in 1921, uh, John Moran started working on a 30 caliber self loading rifle. He submitted prototypes to the U.S. Army in 1922, 1926, 1929, and then finally in 1932 submitted a prototype that was functional that met with the basic uh, approval of the U.S. Army. However, they did want him to make some changes, and in 1939, the U.S. of Garand, as John Garand introduced it, was accepted by use by the U.S. Army and went into production. In 1939, production started. The first 50,000 rifles used a gas trap design, which means that the front of the barrel had a shroud right around the edge, and escaping gas through the barrel was trapped by that shroud and redirected around backwards to operate the opera in the gas port. It was discovered very early, early on that the gas trap style was very difficult to clean. It fouled up in a hurry. It just did not work very well. So in July 1940, the gas port design was dropped, and the barrel gas port, which is about two inches down from the end of the air barrel, they drilled a tiny hole in the barrel. Some of that pressure is tapped off to operate the gas rod. That was continued through the rest of the service life of the M1 Grand. Uh, this rifle was first used in actual combat by the U.S. Marines in the Philippines in early 1942. At that point, the Marines were vehemently stuck with their old three Springfields because they thought once you've got a little bit of sand in this thing, it's going to monk up and it's not going to work. They found out very quickly that that was not the case. This weapon lends itself very well to harsh environments, cold environments, uh, sand, mud, brush the crud out and keep going. Um, let's see. Okay, a few nuances of the M1 Grand. Uh, this is a rifle that has had considerable minor production changes throughout its entire life. Uh, there's whole books the size of phone books dedicated to draw numbers, part numbers, uh, different changes in stocks. Uh, essentially, some of the big, uh, the big things are, one is the trigger guard. Uh, this particular one is stamped, which is not quite correct for World War II. The original World War II trigger guards were milled. However, the stamped steel trigger guard was introduced I thought they were, I thought I wrote that down so. Okay, the stamped trigger guard was introduced in July 1944. Pretty late in the war, but it still made it into service. So the stamped trigger guard, although not the most common, was used in World War II. Uh, one of the other features is the lock bar rear sight. Uh, originally, M1 Garands came with a straight bar on the rear sight assembly. You did your adjustment and then you locked it down with that lock bar. 
Uh, that setup was used all the way through World War II. However, it was very trouble prone. It had four different provisions throughout the war because that lock bar had come loose and fallen off, rendering the sights almost useless. Uh, this one does not have that. Most rifles that were re-arsenaled after the war, the lock bar sight was removed and a sight similar to this was installed. Um, uh, interesting point of note, all World War II issued Durands were made by either Springfield Arsenal or Winchester. Uh, the International Harvester, Harrington and Richardson, uh, and Springfield made rifles during the Korean War. However, during World War II, Springfield and Winchester were the only two manufacturers of M1 Durands. Um, I think what I'll do, does anybody want a field strip Durand? Or are you guys pretty comfortable with? Thanks. Okay. The field strip Durand is a fairly simple operation. This particular rifle does have a blank adapter. Uh, what I'm doing here is I'm taking the gas port locking screw out. Ordinarily, what you would do is you would take that screw out and take off the ink ring. However, in place of the ink ring, we have the blank adapter. So I'll take that off. The reason I take this off first is because it can be real difficult to get this locking screw out when you got the strip, when you got the stock removed from the rifle. It's just hard to grab. So I usually at least loosen that or take it out before I take the rifle apart. Now, to remove the stock from the rifle is a very simple operation. Pull backwards on the trigger guard and lift up and the whole trigger assembly comes right out of the rifle. At that point, once the trigger housing is removed, take the tail of the rifle receiver, pull it right out of the stock. At this point, take out the hot rod spring. That 
that is essentially it. Tighten up your gas dump, and that's about it. How long did you say a routine cleaning of that would take? Uh, a good cleaning, 15 minutes. Swap the barrel out, knock the dust and chunkers off of the equipment. That's it.